Uh, recording a thank you <laughs> we are recording this event so that we can share it with anyone who signed up who wasn't able to attend so if you um if you don't want to appear on the recording you can um hide your camera um so hello to everyone and welcome thank you for joining us i hope you're if you're in the uk feeling the relief of some rain after so many hot days i know i am so welcome to Change from the Inside Out. We have been really looking forward to this discussion all about microclimates for learning and change inside organizations. I'm Zara and I run Huddlecraft and we specialize in peer-to-peer -peer learning, peer-to-peer -peer support, peer-to-peer -peer action. And so in terms of this theme, We've been thinking about it a lot over the past five years in terms of the peer groups that we run. And we bring small groups of people together to learn from one another, to pool their resources. And within those groups, they are creating a micro culture or a micro climate where the sort of cultural values and rules are very often a little bit different to the cultural values and rules that those people are part of and experiencing in other areas of their lives. Um, and so initially we've been doing that um, outside of organizations. And then increasingly over time, we've been doing that more and more inside organizations as well. And that's kind of taken that discussion um, to a bit of another level because then the microclimate, that microculture exists also within a wider network and within a wider ecosystem and is in relationship with it. Um, and then other interesting questions arise um, about how the impact of that microculture can actually ripple out beyond that space um, into the wider organization. And so that is really what we're here to um, talk about today with our speakers. Um, and so you, you might be arriving not having thought about this particular metaphor of microclimates before. You might normally be thinking about culture or learning programs or learning and development or peer groups or teams. Um, but hopefully there will be some value and some juice in this discussion for you. And I wanted to give just a couple of examples of microclimates um, to get us going um, in this theme before we hear from our speakers. So I'm really briefly going to share my screen with you. So let's have a look here. And make it big so you can see it. Um, so the first example of a microclimate that I wanted to share is this example of waffle gardens and this is a, a low-tech in indigenous um, design practice from Mexico from the Zumi people um, and this is a form of community gardening that is traditionally led by women and children. And I think this is a really interesting example of how a microclimate can create a really different environment to the surrounding environment through very, very small changes. So what you're looking at on this slide here um, are sunken um, areas, these, these squares in this grid, they're sunken only by 10 centimeters. And just by having that 10 centimeter indent, more water is able to be captured within those cells. Um, they're protected from wind, the plants that grow in those cells. Um, erosion is limited. And so a really, really big difference is able to be created by just a very simple intervention. Um, and different things can grow there than if this structure wasn't there. And so that's the kind of thing we're really interested in in terms of um, organizations as well today. But it also, it begs the question then with the Waffle Gardens example, does this actually impact the wider environment? If you're creating these cells where different things can grow, does the impact of that actually spread um, beyond those cells into the surrounding climate? 
Um, and so that leads me to this second um, example of a microclimate here, um, which was which was in the event description as well of stone lines and stone lines are used to regreen dry land that has been affected by climate change and works in quite a similar way, actually, to the Waffle Gardens, but means that water is captured, sheltered. Um, seeds can get captured in and amongst the stones um, and because the water is captured there as well they are able to grow and germinate in a way that they can't in the rest of the dry land and the purpose of stone lines is very much to um, change what's possible at the edge so that that green area can grow and get larger and larger and larger and then um, ultimately um, change the land, re-green the land around it. So what we're going to do today is be thinking about this kind of thing, um, but in terms of social and relational constructs, so within organisations. And we're going to hear from four speakers first, and then we're going to have a discussion as well. So whilst we hear from them if you want to put questions and things like that in the chat please do please feel free we'll try and circle back to a couple of those questions um, at the end of our discussion and i think we will start with joanna if you're ready um, and i will time i will keep my microphone on and i will time five minutes so you should hear um, a five minute warning and then you can um, wrap up at that point um, thank you, Zara. Hello, everyone. Really good to meet you. And thank you, Zara, for inviting me. Such an interesting theme for this event. Um, so I'm Joanna Shuker, and I'm Director of Design and Innovation at the RSA. For some of you who um, don't know the RSA, we're a social change organisation with a global network of 30,000 change makers, enabling people, place and planet to flourish. And our vision is for a world where everyone can fulfill their potential to shape a resilient, rebalanced and regenerative world. And um, the shorthand for that is our design for life vision and mission, which we have recently launched in May. Um, so my role at the RSA is to champion how best and next design and innovation practice and thinking can contribute to and accelerate this vision and mission. So my connection to the, th to the theme is huge. I was uh, talking about that briefly before um, I joined uh, this call. Um, we, as I mentioned, we recently launched our Design for Life mission with Andy Heldane joining as chief exec in April of this year. Um, in the Design for Life mission, we acknowledge that our world as it is and our current systems as they are are failing. Um, they are fragile, they're unbalanced and they're extractive. Um, we have often looked at a lot of the issues and challenges and crises that we've been experiencing as separate um, and disconnected, um, you know, everything across sort of the economy, social society and the ecology. And we need to totally shift our focus to recognizing the interdependence between our social and environmental and economic challenges and fundamentally seeing the system as necessary. So our economy there to serve wider society and our ecology for our social outcomes to to serve um, the, you know, the people, communities, but also to, to, to care for and look after our wider ecological system. So if you sort of imagine that sort of three systems nested within each other. Um, so in order to totally shift, um, move towards that para, para, uh, paradigm shift, we know that incremental change is not going to be enough. We need transformative change. We can't tweak our current failing systems where we treat every issue as separate from the other. We need to totally reimagine a future where we draw on, recognize this independence and lean into that and look at the, the impact of our, our activity, of our work, of everything that we're, we're innovating around across all of these different layers of the system. Um, so as Albert Einstein puts it, we can't solve the problems um, of today with the same kinds of thinking that created them. So for me, microclimates within organizations and then the ripple effects into the wider systems are about sort of these ways of thinking or what we have started describing at the RSA as design for life perspectives. And the reason we talk about perspectives and not principles is because we want to leave room for plur plurality and ad adaptability as opposed to sort of a checklist of you have to do these five things and then you've got the microclimate that you need for any kind of change. Um, so we believe that to create radically different systems, we need mi different microclimates for more regenerative, um, innovation that is sheltered from the dominant climates of extractive 
um, growth innovation that has fundamentally driven how we innovate and how we progress, uh, particularly in, in recent history, sort of the last 200 years, years or so. Um, so we've drawn on a couple of examples um, of work, learnings from a couple of examples of work um, that has helped us shape these sort of design for life um, perspectives. The first is our work with NHS Lodi and over the last year, um, we've worked with public entrepreneurs, a cohort of public entrepreneurs, basically NHS staff, um, to support them to think more entrepreneurially from within their own organizations and the services they deliver and to encourage them to work differently with the public. So in that microclimate, they worked with the public, not for public consultation, but to draw in collective imagination about the future of the place um, on different places in, in Scotland that would enable people to really shape how well-being is at the heart of, um, of what, what these better futures could look like. So citizens were involved in basically collective imagination, futures, visioning work that would then drive the agenda of what sort of the civil servants would then innovate around. And the second example is our Rethink Fashion um, journey, which was delivered in partnership with the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, where we brought together a cohort of um, regenerative fashion startups, entrepreneurs, um, to totally redefine the future of fashion to be more regenerative. So some of the shifts that we supported as part of that microclimate for the cohort is the shift from competition to cooperation um, and to recognizing that we need diverse actors in the system. Um, so rather than sort of fashion startups thinking about one another as competitors of, you know, what's the next best, best thing? How can I demonstrate that I have a unique selling point? They're thinking about how, how can we together create a coalition that can collectively support us to, to transform the system? And how can we work in partnership with the incumbents like the H&Ms and you know, some of the fashion brands and fashion giants to transform how they approach um, fashion innovation and, and, and fashion, fashion business models. Um, so there's a few more I could draw on, including the Economic Security Impact Accelerator that actually Hubbercraft was involved in and some of our work with Cities of Learning. I can see my colleague Janvi on the call. But broadly, what we have done is draw from us these, some of these learnings around these kind of microclimates that we've, these sort of safe spaces that we've created to try and think very radically and, and very differently about the future, to propose these six perspectives, design for life perspectives. So the first is systemic, so recognizing that our systems are nested and interconnected, as I mentioned earlier. Imaginative, that we need to really lean into our capacity to imagine as humans, um, to really think about radically different alternatives for the future to be adaptive, so moving away from this sort of, oh, there's there's you know one final solution, we can never ever get to sort of a, a finite solution. What we need to do is work in adaptive ways, similar to nature, lots of feedback loops, and then move and tweak and, and find our way forward. Collective, so drawing on collective wisdom and the diversity of different voices, um, including the beyond the human. So what can we learn from nature around how we actually innovate and move forward? Embracing long-term thinking, um, so moving beyond the sort of myopic uh, paradigms of the now in terms of how policy is shaped, how funding is distributed, um, how regulation works, how you know, incentive models work. So really to think about how we can be sort of longer steward, long-term stewards um, and how we leave the planet in a better place. And then finally, global. Um, so challenging the sort of global scale, one size fits none, to really recognizing that the change needs to happen from place, from context, from the energy of the resources, the heritage and the assets in that place. So in terms of rippling impact, um, we've sort of articulating these perspectives has been really helpful for us. And we're now embedding these in all of our work and the work that we do with our fellows, but we'll continue to adapt them and recognize that these are constantly, we should be constantly evolving. Um, but yeah, I think I'll leave it. I'll leave it at that, Zara. I don't know if I'm to time or beyond time. <laughs> a little bit over, but all good, all very interesting. And yeah, I feel like that's such a, a great place to start because um, you've got that idea of really, really transformative, large scale change that's needed. And then you've got um, the theme of this event today, which is about microclimates and the power of smaller groups and smaller clusters. And I think that's such an interesting um, question here is sort of the connection between the small um, and the large and how they can interact. Thanks, Joe. OK, so moving on to Colin, if you're ready. Yeah, ready to go. Um, before I go into, I mean, uh, I think it was really brilliant what Joanne, what you just said, and it's it's fascinating to hear talking about things at such a large scale, societal level change. 
Um, and I'm going to bring our conversation to something that's much uh, smaller. But yeah, like I said, you said lots of brilliant things, but one of the things you said that just really jumped at, at me is one size fits none. I, I, I think I'm writing that down because <laughs> I think it's such a powerful way of, of rethinking about the way we come up with, with standardization and, and, and answers. Anyway, I'll introduce myself. I'm Colin Lyons. I am the Delivery and Transformation Director um, at Us2. Us2 is a product, uh, digital product studio. We do client work, we build apps and websites for our clients. Um, and I've been here for about nine years and basically in my responsibility is to do two main things. One is make sure that when we take on our client work, we deliver on our expectations. So that's the delivery component of my, my responsibility. But then it's also the transformation, which is um, helping our clients move in a path that allows them to be able to take the work that we've done and carry it forward. Um, it's interesting to, to think about the, the challenge that we have as us to, to create these products because the client will come to us usually because either they don't have the capacity or they don't have the capability or sometimes both. And they want uh, to create something that's going to be innovative for them. So they'll come to us for that. But one of the things that we found over time is that we create these products, but then once it was relinquished back to the client, they didn't have an environment in which to let those products live. And a lot of people come to us to uh, come because they want to change. They want things in the world that they've designed and created and built. So we realized that one of the things that we had to add to our offering was supporting our clients so that our products didn't go back into their environment to die, which is what was happening often. So that's kind of uh, the connection that I feel to this discussion because if a client doesn't have the environment to nurture and continue to support a digital product, then you know we have a job to do to help them figure out how to make that change. And prior to coming to us too, I spent most of my career supporting uh, client, uh, supporting environments and organizations becoming more digital, whatever that means in, in various contexts. And so um, this was you know, one of the things that I've been looking at and seeing lots of times in history where it just never seemed to make any progress at the time it seemed did and like, what was the difference? Uh, an example I just wanna share, which I think would just kind of put more specificity in what I'm talking about is we worked with three um, some years ago and that was a long standing relationship with a woman that had worked at Harvey Nichols first, and then she went to three and so on. And she came to us when she went to three because of the work we did with her at Harvey Nichols, because she saw a new way of working. And she said, what I saw there, I want to bring wherever I go. So she contacted us when she was at three and we basically set up what I didn't know as a language for microclimate, but we set up this kind of a bubble in which um, we could do what we wanted. Like we, we didn't, we could kind of in, insulate ourselves from the rest of the organization and do things in a way that was uh, quicker and more effective and all the things that we want to get as outcomes. And in that context, the strategy was don't try to convince anybody outside the organization of anything. Just do the thing and let them see what we're doing in a very open and transparent way and see what happens. That was really kind of the strategy. And what ended up happening is people started to, and it didn't have to go this way, but the way in this case, people started to say, they look like they're having fun. They're getting more stuff done. Why can't we do what they're doing, <laughs> right? And so it kind of took a, a bit of a um, uh, organic way in which things uh, sort of flourished. Um, and just, you know, I don't want to take up all the time, but my, my, my closing thought here is one of the things I've learned through uh, my experience in trying to help organizations change the way they operate is, A, the thing we're talking about, the language sounds like it's the things that they're doing. But the truth is, it's the way that they're thinking and the way and it's the mindset thing that makes all the difference. And because of that, what I've noticed is that, at least notice is probably too strong a word, what I've decided to hold as a philosophy is my intention isn't to change an organization. My intention is to change an individual or change individuals. I think sort of the idea of organizational transformation is too big a mountain and it fails often. And that what I find happens more often is that you have people who get transformed through that process, just like this client we had at three, and now she's transformed. Everywhere she goes, she wants to work this way. Um, and so yeah, this idea of, of uh, transformation for me is much more about looking at how do we uh, change the mindset of people. I think doing that on a, on a mass scale is uh, very, very difficult. But if you can do that on inspire people, get them to experience something differently and see the benefit of the, of the um, outcomes that they get able to produce in this way, they're inspired to keep going. And that's why, that's why I think it's sort of transformation. That's me. Wonderful. That was literally as the buzzer went off. 
plot marks for timing. Um, and yeah, so we've gone from that sort of how can microclimates influence transformative large scale change to is actually one of the best strategies or a strategy to focus on a really deep change within just an individual in order that the influence can can spread out wider. Interesting stuff. OK, and so Yolana, moving over to you if you're ready now as well. Yes, thank you. Can you all hear me? Great. Well, thanks. Um, so it's really great to be here with you all and really interesting stuff already has been said. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm Yolana and um, I was born in Bohemia, which is northwest region of Czech Republic, but I've lived in the UK all my life. And a fun fact, my surname is Palestinian and currently I'm, I'm tuning in from an ashram in India. Uh, and so back in 2017, I joined the League of Entrepreneurs, and I was absolutely in awe of what our co-founders, Maggie Dupree and Florencia Estrada, were doing with a group of, a quite small group of change makers, entrepreneurs, and catalysts of change. And yeah, um, over the years, I wore different hats, and now my role is head of experience, which kind of is... Um, really nurturing the microclimate of our community and expanding on that, but also leading on our programs. And currently I'm developing um, what we call the I am in online learning pathways for entrepreneurs, which will be launched in October at Global Entrepreneur Week, um, which is our sort of annual platform that we build for entrepreneurship to really celebrate entrepreneurs and their work. Um, and I'll tell you a bit more later as well. Um, the league sort of the idea of the League of Entrepreneurs is rooted in that our incumbent organizations have a role to play um, in creating a just, equitable, and regenerative world. So a little bit, I would say from a little bit from Joanna's perspective and a little bit from Colin's perspective, because we believe that entrepreneurs within these organizations are innovators on the inside who are harnessing the assets of these organizations for positive systems change. So really looking at the people who work inside these organizations as human beings, so quite to what Colin was saying, and sort of bringing change from that perspective um, in a sense where we inspire each other to align our purpose and our values with those of the organization and hopefully that way um, really bring in on change. Um, so since 2018, uh, in, we've been running programs that we call League of Entrepreneurs Fellowship. And that's the program for senior entrepreneurs who work in these incumbent organizations, which is um, one example of a microclimate that we are nurturing in the League. And to become a League of Entrepreneurs Fellow, you have to be nominated. And today we have and there's like a really thorough selection process. And from the first email that you receive or from the nomination, the environment is nurtured in such a way that uh, the culture of the fellowship is very like almost instantaneously trusting. So here we are connecting entrepreneurs from organizations from all over the world, from all different sectors. And without perhaps even first meeting before they already are on a level where they can openly share their challenges as entrepreneurs and what they are working on and support each other's as peers um, but we realized that to really bring change in our lifetime we have to open up and really inspire I'd say the whole workforce of employees to become entrepreneurs. So that is what the I'm in learning online learning pathways for entrepreneurs is about. It's about really educating employees and sort of inspiring employees from all levels to, yeah, to want to change things, whatever the change might be. It might be change that is just, I don't know, changing a product that the organization is using for their coffees or um, bringing on a project that will really change the face of the business that, that they work in for. 
And so um, just to close, I would like to all invite you because if you're interested more into entrepreneurship and in entrepreneurial culture, we are holding the Global Entrepreneur Week, which is really all about entrepreneurship. And this year we have uh, a theme uh, that's all about courage. What is the next step? Is moment for courage? What are the next steps? What are the conversations we need to be having so that we really can um, inspire change and reach the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals? So it will be 10 to 4 14 October, it's uh, online and also offline. So for those who are in London on the 17th of October, we'll be at Salesforce Tower and I'll drop a link below if you're interested to join us. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the time. I hope I didn't go over. No, bang on as well. Thank you very much, Yolana. Um, and I think it's, it's interesting that the word courage came up there because that's something that I've heard quite a bit in previous discussions about um, this theme and actually the power of a smaller cluster as opposed to a larger movement in terms of really giving people um, courage to actually change themselves or change something else. Um, and maybe that's something we can get into more in a bit. Um, and so then last but not least, Annika. Hi everyone, um, I'm Annika and I work at Huddlecraft, um, which uh, as Zara shared before, is an ecosystem of support for peer-led learning and change. Because at Huddlecraft, we believe that the story of the 21st century is and, and will continue to be about the steepest learning curves collective learning curves that we've we've ever faced in history um, a learning curve that calls us to create the regenerative future that we know we need and so at Huddlecraft we get to work with a wide range of change practitioners from people leading international initiatives to learning and development leads to grassroots change makers and I'll give you kind of two stories of how we've um, supported organizations to create microclimates of change um, and the first the first story is actually uh, related to the RSA and so um, with an approach that uh, Joanna will be very familiar with um, with their living change approach which is the approach the RSA use as an organization to understand and act on complex and systemic problems um, and they wanted to build capacity in this particular approach with their staff with their fellows their partners um, and so what they did is came to Huddlecraft to develop and test a peer group learning experience within the organization um, and so we trained two of their staff internally to co-design and co-host the journey um, which was a journey that 10 people went on over three months where every one of those 10 people brought an inquiry question that they would be exploring over the three months in connection with the living change approach. And what they found in, in hosting that peer-led learning journey within the organization is that it was a really generative space that really prompted people to go deep with their inquiry questions, many of which evolved over those three months and into what they never would have imagined when they started. Um, and it, it created really deep group connection within that group. And so as a result of that journey, this has created a, a ripple effect with the, within the RSA with people taking the living change approach from something that was, you know, on the page and something that perhaps was more theoretical into real life examples and, and real practical ways that they've been applying this pro approach and having champions within the organisation for the approach. But as well as this, having this kind of... Um, peer-led learning approach within the organization has inspired those who have been involved to design in elements of this approach into a wide range of um, other projects through developing their own craft of leading peer-led learning. Um, and most of all, what our, our uh, clients at the RSA have talked about is that a year on from that program, the relational ties that have developed have seeded all sorts of new possibilities and practical collaborations within their organization. Um, and so it's really powerful bringing together this cluster of people who are going on a common journey over time, all exploring their own questions, but as part of the same journey. Um, and so our second the second example I'll talk about um, is with the uh, with the NHS. Um, so this time not uh, up in Scotland, but down in the southwest. Um, and the the NHS South leadership Southwest Leadership Academy um, is a part of the NHS that was established in 2012 to develop outstanding leadership in the NHS through a range of programs, courses, and networks. 
And the Academy really saw an opportunity for peer led approaches to learning and support to play a bigger role in helping them meet their objectives in, in creating really incredible learning opportunities for their people. Um, but they wanted to build capacity internally for people to take a lead in implementing these approaches rather than just having a top down, you know, we're going to do we're going to do it this way. They wanted people to be able to have uh, grow their capacity and be able to creatively implement these these approaches in whatever setting they were working with. So at Huddlecraft, we ran a, a seven session training for them, which is an immersive into peer led approaches. And they had 16 staff members involved from all the way from organizational development, L&D, um, to senior managers, to people involved in clinical roles. So much more kind of on the front lines. Um, and for those who were involved, what they talked about was that Get, take, having a, this immersive into peer-led approaches really shifted their own approach, their own mindset around learning and collaboration within their organisation and really stimulated their thinking about how they could go from being an active, a passive recipient of learning, um, learning experiences to an active proponent within those learning experiences. Um, people really found the sessions really energizing. And so they were taking part in this experience where they were collectively energized and connected to people who were a bit more like them within the organization and also going through these hands-on learning activities together. Um, and people walked away with practical, pragmatic tools that they could apply straight away rather than it being something that they needed to have you know, spend another three months developing. They, they had spent some time designing within those sessions and beginning to design using the structures that we had brought to them um, to, to really kind of mean that they were, they were starting not from scratch when they went back to their own settings, but they were starting with an existing structure to help them test out new ideas. Um, and from that, multiple people were aiming to use it as a starting point to influence and change culture within their teams, their wider directorates, in a really sustainable way, being able to build on the tools, the structure, the energy, um, and the connection they got from doing the training. Um, and so, yeah, really exciting to see those two projects kind of come to life within those organisations um, and to really um, recognise that what we were doing is supporting people to be a, a microclimate themselves, but also supporting them to build microclimates within their organisations and within the different departments and, and parts of the organisation they were part of. Um, and so what we think is that peer learning within organisations can be a really powerful way to create a microclimate for change. Um, and for any organisations, if you're in an organisation, you're like, I want I want some of that where I am. Um, we are actually open at the moment for applications for our host fellowship for organisations where you would learn these, these peer led practices and be supported to create a peer learning group within your organisation. So please do chat to anyone from Huddlecraft um, about that if it's something that you're interested in. Um, but we're really excited about this um, as, a, as a way of really seeding a really different way of being and experiencing and learning together. Wonderful. Thanks, Annika. Okay, and so I feel like Annika's sort of segued me into what I'm going to ask um, first um, by by talking about how with the NHS work, people were then going back into their own teams, their own departments, their own regions, um, and how can they take um, the culture from that microclimate and take it back to their to their own region, to their own context, and so. With that in mind, what is actually needed then for the benefits created within a microclimate to nurture the environments around them? And I should say that this is a question that Yolana has, um, has posed to the rest of the speakers. And, and what I've done ahead of the event is gather some questions from everyone for one another. Um, and hopefully we'll also have time to take some from the chat as well in a bit. So yeah, who would like to jump in first? What is needed for the impact to spread beyond the microclimate? Um, I'm happy to jump in on that. Um, 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the key parts of the learning journeys that we support people to host um, is that they, everyone taking part in a learning journey, whether it's a three month or a six month, they externalize their learning in some way. Um, and we really encourage people to make something or to create something that really shares what they're learning with a, the wider group, with the wider world. Um, and so um, towards the, the end of our, our learning journeys, um, we we off, we encourage people to do something called a showcase and actually having something that has quite a lot of high energy about it where there's you know everyone knows there's going to be a public uh presentation of what they're doing it really encourages people to um externalize their learning in a way that is accessible to other people um, and i think that is a really powerful way of rippling out um within organizations what a microclimate has been doing and learning and exploring um, within their own within their, within their, within their own setting, um, and so I think yeah that that wider st storytelling piece is really important. Mm, thank you. So that's sort of about demonstrating and storytelling. Colin, I wonder if I can come to you where it's more about how do you leave that culture behind once you've come in as a collaborative team um, for a client? How do you then leave that culture behind when you go? Is there also storytelling um, going on there too? There is. And I, I guess the word that I would use that um, takes the same sort of uh, positioning that Annika talked about is uh transparency so you know our way of working we work with our clients is being really open about what we're doing as we're doing it showing work in progress and so on and, and this idea of a showcase fits quite nicely with how we at the end of every two weeks we're demonstrating the progress that we've made uh and i feel like in the places where i've seen it work is where the transparency is um is allowed, you know, where, the, where, where there isn't the barriers for political reasons and so on inside the organization to present, prevent it. But when that's allowed, I think people get inspired and uh, they feel like this is, they want a piece of that. They want to, they want to, they want to understand a bit more about it and so on. And I think also we can't ignore that the whole purpose of all the change we're talking about is for improvement. So I think when people start to see results from a different way of approaching things, that can also be inspiring. It can also be threatening for other groups, uh, but in, in some in, in places where I, I feel like it's I've seen it be most effective is when positive results are visible and the way we got there was visible and that there is a, an openness to want to change. Mm. I feel like that brings up resistance as well. And I'm curious, um, Joe or Yulana, when you've come up against resistance to this kind of rippling out. Um, of the benefits and maybe what you've done in order to overcome that resistance or how you've pivoted? Mm, I'm happy to come in on that actually. Um, I think it's, um, I think actually, you know, Colin and Annika have sort of talked about showcasing, sort of showing the value. Um, I think there's also value in experiencing, inviting people to experience what it feels like to be within that microclimate. And there's sort of small examples of the conditions that we've created in these microclimates that we could transfer to the dominant climate to try and create that open invitation in. I think when we talk about, you know, and your question around resistance, I think we often look at resistance as a negative thing, right? You know, we've, oh, there's so much resistance. There's so much internal change, um, change fatigue. If, if there isn't resistance, if there isn't tension, if there isn't friction, then, then we're not changing anything. And so I see, I look at these points of tension as, and points of friction as there's, there's a dial that's shifting and people are coming on the journey. And so looking at these points of resistance as moments of opportunity to engage in a very, very different conversation and to really speak to that conflict directly rather than try and avoid it or avert it is really important. And some of the helpful questions um, that I guess have supported us at the RSA, because a lot of what we're describing here, what I mentioned earlier in sort of my, my five minute presentation was, um, were things that we've learned through some of the living change work we've done with, with yourselves and also on the Regenerative Futures program. So what has been the pivot of these microclimates then becoming at the heart of the whole organizational mission, not sort of a couple of programs that were running, you know, running um, in sort of a fringe of the organization. And actually, some of these broader questions around 
what are we all valuing here? Maybe actually the starting points are very different in, ter in terms of what we're trying to achieve. So I think questions like, why are we doing this? Why are we doing it this way? What are we hoping to achieve? Are we, you know, are we valuing productivity, efficiency, equity? You know, what, what are we prioritizing in terms of the, the long-term change that we want to see? And then from that, what kind of climates do we need to create that enable that? Do we first align on what, what we're trying to, the change we're trying to see? And then from there, what kind of climates could be more enabling and supportive of that? Mm. So rather than the how, focus on the why. Yeah, and, and so Yulana, when, when we think about the League of Entrepreneurs, you must have people who come into your programs, into your microclimate and identify, just like Joe was just saying, um, things that they want to prioritize, things that they want to value, things that they want to take back into their large organizations. Um, and they must then count, encounter uh, moments of opportunity or resistance when, when they get there. Um, and I'm curious about how you support them to make that resistance an opportunity rather than just um, a roadblock as well. Yeah, thank you. Um, well, we often speak about, or well, one of our values is being human. And so humanness and bringing humanness to work I, I think that's um, something that can really flip um, failure around. So when we are resist uh, meeting with resistance or meeting with uh, walls that don't allow us to go through, uh, we often speak about pathfinding. So entrepreneurs work is really navigating an uncharted territory and that why they just need to kind of find a way uh, around uh, and this often happens at least like from our support through peer learning action learning we use the methodology of case clinics which I think is incredible because you come with a question asking powerful questions uh, asking the why's and the what and how might we and um, supporting each others with powerful questions to find the path to really find the, the way and often what can happen is that you completely change perspective because you might you might want to go a certain way because our mind is trying to engage that we need to go a certain way because we are meeting our kpis or uh, need to sort of the entrepreneurs are the doers who really want to um, get the action done get the change done and now and um that's not always what is what might be needed sometimes the change that they are working on might require uh, pausing and just allowing a, a new way to show itself in a way which is a sort of like the emergence that the theory of you uh, is often speaking about mm. yeah and it's interesting so you're talking about urgency and actually that really brings me to um, a question from Colin for the rest of you, um, which is about timing as well. And so how does timing influence the successful expansion of the microclimate into the rest of the organization? And I guess um, that means timing in terms of when you start, but perhaps we can also think about um, timing in terms of the pace um, at which we travel as well. Um, so anyone who'd like to come in on that, please do. Or I'll pick someone. I, I'd like to share a little example uh, of one of our members, for example. She's been working for many years on uh, trying to push to her organization um, so products more focusing around climate change, sustainable finance, and really long time just trying to push the rock up the, up the mountain. And uh, in the recent years, this has become quite a popular 
particular topic and organizations are realizing that they really need to start shifting things and that there is an opportunity for them, which then created a very quickly created an opportunity for her to create her own job position. And now she's leading a whole group of her colleagues to create products that bring more sustainable finance services to the organization. Uh, so here's like a really good example where the resilience and keeping going and having faith uh, and, and sort of determination uh, is so important. But then when uh, the world is also seeing what we are seeing, that that's the right timing. And that's when um, the change can really happen quickly and accelerate what we're trying to do. Mm, great. Maybe we can take another comment on timing as well. I'm happy to come in, Zara. <laughs> Um, I think it builds on um, Yolanda's point, actually, on, um, I guess, what we describe as RSA is energy for change, where there is energy for change. And sometimes that energy is internal, sometimes it's external, sort of the wider socioeconomic conditions that we're operating within and the broadly sort of the public narratives and um, the appetite for, for a very different kind of conversation or a challenge of the dominant conversation. Um, so I think, I mean, I, I, if I can sort of speak from experience and the example of the journey we've been at the RSA, a change of leadership is a very important moment for any organization um, and a huge opportunity um, to really influence from within and from outside. Um, because as we know, often leaders come and want new, newness and novelty <laughs> as much as sort of we all value sort of retaining the old and, and, and nurturing the old. Um, there's always that element of actually really rethinking an opportunity to stop and think and to pause as Yolano um, fra framed it. So I think looking at shifts and changes within the organization in terms of leadership feel like really pivotal moments. And then really thinking about how I love like Colin's description of you're not changing organizations, you're changing individuals from within and their ways of thinking. And then they are then catalysts that influence and change the wider. I think in terms of pace, it's really something that we it's, it's really hard to straddle, to, to straddle with or try and balance. Um, particularly if you're looking at very radical changes in the climate of an organization, you can go fast if you go alone. <laughs> Or you might have to go a bit slow to bring others along, but if you're too slow and you can't really demonstrate the value and for people to start to recognize. So I think how do you how do you strike that balance where you can be bold and brave um, whilst bring people on that journey? I think it's really difficult. I think it's sort of I've been on different sides of that in different organizations and don't think I've got the right answer, but it's definitely something to consider. Thank you. And when we think about bringing other people along with us, Annika, you had this question for everyone um, about seeking buy-in. So how do the other speakers seek buy-in for creating these spaces within organisations? Um, I'd love to ask Colin for an answer on this one. How do you, how do you seek that buy-in for these countercultural spaces? Yeah, I mean, I guess the way in which we tend to engage with our clients is we have the opportunity to pitch, right? So part of our pitch process kind of is a, in some sense, it's a filtering process of people who actually are interested in what we have to offer. Um, so by the time we're working with them, we're probably entering, pushing on a bit of an open door. It's not entirely um, the same as an entrepreneur who might be trying to make something happen, but doesn't necessarily have the buy in, in internally. That said, Sometimes they say they want to buy it and they're ready to go. And then the reality is when you get there, either what they had in mind, what we had in mind when we spoke about it were two different things, even though we're using the same language, or that the one part of the organization wants it, but the part we're working with isn't actually the one who's going to get the benefit of our services. So I think all of that plays a role. Um, but all that said, I think uh, I feel like a little bit of a broken record, but I, I feel like my personal strategy is to show, not tell a bit, you know, like a bit of telling to kind of set the scene, but then use uh, the evidence of what we're doing to, 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 to create buy-in. I mean, a, a good example, um, I can give you if I, I got a moment to say, we don't have much time left, but essentially we're working with a 250 year old organization. Um, they're very much um, a bricks and mortar type of environment. 
and they needed to, they, one of their challenges was getting things changed on the website faster. So they hired us and the guy who said to me, when he hired me, the head of marketing, he said, do not try to transform us. I'm not interested in transformation. And I knew that to get what he wants, there's only one way to get there. You got to change right? because there's something not working that's causing you not to get what you want anyway. So what we did in, internally, we decided we're not going to talk about change. We're just going to do stuff and we're going to work with them with a partner, collaborate and so on. And when we finally got to the end of the engagement with them, which ended up being about a year and a half, two years, um, as a wrap up session, uh, the same guy said, you know, I told you not to transform me, but thank you for transforming me. And I feel like if I had done what I normally would have done, which is spend a lot of time trying to explain why it's so important to change and show where all the pain points are and how we can fix, I, I think I would have lost him and we probably wouldn't work together. Whereas by just deciding, let's just do what we do and hope that that demonstrates why the change is necessary that we would get there. So I think that's, sometimes we don't have luxury of that. But I think if we do have luxury of that, I think that's a, a one strategy that can, that can work and get mm -hmm. involved in the yeah, and that's inherently about timing as well, of course, like the timing of when you are explicit about all of your uh, intentions, maybe. Um, I'd love to hear from I, I want to just add one thing. That sounded like it was calculated and planned. It wasn't. <laughs> he resisted my phone calls. <laughs> so I wasn't actually able to do what I would normally do, which is try to do all the things I said. But in the end, when I look back on it, that was the saving grace because he wasn't interested in hearing any of that stuff. Yeah, and I, I I do think that's really interesting. We're not going to talk about change. Like when when is not talking about change actually um, more beneficial and more strategic? I think that's really really interesting. Um, so I've realised you know a lunchtime one hour conversation is not long enough for this really interesting discussion. Um, Katie, do you have a really juicy question from the chat so we can take one from um, the chat as well before we wrap up? Yeah, I feel like there have been three sort of overlap overlapping ones, which is about the resilience and the fragility of microclimates and how can we protect them from dominant culture? How can we ensure that they survive? What breaks them? It's that kind of fragility resilience idea. Mm. Who would like to take that one? Mm, I think... Um just something to say on this is that I think when the people involved in that microclimate are really in it because they're you know they believe in it it connects to a personal passion of theirs um they'll 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 make it happen even if that means they have to go under the you know kind of hidden a little bit um like when there's that personal uh, energy for for being part of a group like this which I think you know when it's a group who feel like a cohort who feel connected to each other they'll find ways of meeting they'll find ways of sharing they'll find ways of learning regardless of what the dominant culture is um, so I think you know I, I almost a kind of echo of Colin's somewhat covert approach I think sometimes uh, doing it in that way can be really powerful for spreading a culture without explicitly shouting this is what we're doing this is how we're doing it. I, I love that. And I would just add that for me, it's a lot about having rituals as communities, as people that come together on their same, same sort of fire in the belly. Having rituals really keeps the container contained. And it, that way it protects it from whatever the outside is uh, going through. And on a flip side, it can also sort of ripple out from that I can add something very brief which is I think it's I, I feel it's really important for microclimates to be porous um, because it's important for these microclimates to influence and shape the dominant cultures so I think as long as those involved in creating and shaping and stewarding these microclimates are aligned around the purpose, what they're trying to create and why, that really holds that sense of truth and that sort of alignment to North Stars, really holding on to that, but then create this sort of opportunities for these sort of permeable, um, yeah, a permeable membrane that can sort of invite others in, inspire, um, but where there is energy, where there's energy for change and where there's appetite. Mm, permeable boundaries nice thank you so with our last two minutes I'm gonna I'm gonna put you for on the spot and say um 
as a closing comment, do you have one top tip for people on this call who are also um, creating microclimates within um, organizations they are connected to? Um, and go when you're ready until we've um, heard from each of you. I mean, I can, I can go. I have something really brief to say. I think because I was introduced to this language for the first time through this event, I think it's a fantastic metaphor um, to use in thinking through things. I mean, Joanna used lots of phrases I've written down. I love the way you phrase what you talk about. And I think talking about the porousness of, of it and, and the protection of it, I think that, that you know, even the imagery um, that Zara, you shared at the very beginning, I think that's just a really good uh, frame to hold in mind as you're navigating whatever the context might be in trying to make change. Um, so, you know, for anyone who's new to this language, I'd say it's a great metaphor to hang on to this idea of a microcon and, and using that as a way to, to think through and drive how you make change. Wonderful, thank you. I think my top tip would be about taking an inquiry-based approach to really allow for some of that emergence that Joanna talked about and I'm sure others have touched upon as well. Um, so really, finding the questions that resonate with others to create that microclimate and encouraging others within your organization to also have questions that they're they're aiming to learn about and that that help frame the change that they want to create thank you annika i would say really bringing your full self always and empowering others to bring their full selves to you um yeah i'll leave it there because I, I really believe in empowerment and empowering each other to lead the change that we want to see so not just wait that the leaders out there who are the job titles of a leader will do something meaningful but really taking a proactive approach whatever the situation and last but not least so I would say um, question value and what we are valuing um, when we're approaching any sort of change, organizational change, um, social change. Um, what are the things that we are valuing and what are the things that we are valuing for more or less of and why and ensure that we have um, a good and aligned starting point before doing any of this work um, and then take that as the lead to the kind of microclimates we want to be building. Hey, so we are already one minute over. So I'm gonna really quickly say thank you so much to everyone for coming and thank you um, to you for, for speaking and for being part of this discussion. I feel like there's a lot more um, we can talk about and I know there's a lot of questions in the chat. So in some form, I'm gonna commit to um, bringing something back to all of you who've, who've turned up in response to those questions and we'll also share the recording. Um, so yeah, thank you very much and have a really good afternoon. Enjoy the rain and see you soon. <laughs> All right.